Hi, everybody. My name is Clayton, and I'm the CTO over at Demogi. And I'm here today because I have a confession to make. So I've been working with, in the sector for 15 years with teams of engineers that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any Silicon Valley coder. And every presentation I give has some slight in it, like this one, about how our global good is world-class technology, regardless of the limited resources that we have to build it. But in the back of my mind, there's always been a voice in my head that can't let go of the idea that if, say, Google were actually trying to compete, that they might blow us out of the water. Some magical intuition built from watching disaster movies about blowing up asteroids, that there's some elite skunk works team of the very best Silicon Valley engineers somewhere on standby to save the world. And I recognize that this is a ridiculous thing to think, especially because I've seen firsthand what those teams can do. Back in 2014, the Earth Institute in Columbia was using ComCare to build and share the first template app for fighting the Ebola outbreak with community tracing. After becoming engaged, we ended up supporting a dozen or so stakeholders using technology and novel ways to fight the disease at every level. Nearly two years later, after public health teams deployed tools for everything from contact tracing to providing services for children who were orphaned by the virus, Google did finally show up on the scene swinging in to save the day with magic Ebola-proof tablets the very same month that Liberia reported their last case of the disease. But don't worry, they showed up in plenty of time to still take all the credit. But okay, whether it's fair or equitable, Ebola was fundamentally seen as a West African outbreak. Surely, if the existential threat was right in Silicon Valley's backyard, they'd spring into gear, right? Well, as of March 10th, Silicon Valley was the site of one of the U.S.'s first COVID-19 outbreaks, and Google and Apple teamed up and announced that they had started working on their Silicon Valley solution on April 10th. And five days later, an army of contact tracers from UCSF kicked off full efforts to fight the pandemic in the heart of Silicon Valley, San Francisco, using ComCare. Now, think about that. We're talking about a public health authority whose offices are two blocks away from Twitter's headquarters. And when they needed help, they didn't get it from Silicon Valley. They got it from Sierra Leone. And over the next few months, we built and deployed the contact tracing systems for seven states or health authorities in the U.S. Meanwhile, Apple and Google's notification system still hasn't even deployed to California. It's not clear at this point whether it ever will, since there's no real evidence that it helps. So for the first time in almost two decades, that voice in the back of my head, it's quiet. Well, at least about self-doubt. Now it's terrified. See, it's not just that the world's richest technology teams aren't dedicating their resources and the public interest. They're not even any good at it when they try. And if you understand Silicon Valley, it's easy to understand how we got here. Google publishes a philosophy of sorts every year underlying their principles. The second item on that list is it's best to do one thing really, really well, which is great as long as you're lucky enough that Google decides that solving your problem is the one thing it wants to keep doing well. They're famous for killing successful software. And Google arrived at that philosophy by understanding the financial reality of software development which is that building software starts with some base cost to build the core functionality that most of your users need. But reaching the next 20% of your user base, it isn't 20% of the cost, it's the same cost. Or in some cases, it's even more expensive as you need to re-architect around their needs. Product management is about drawing the right line between cost and value there. But what Google taught the world 20 years ago is that the most profitable path is drastic focusing on the most basic representation of the problem that affects the widest possible audience. And more than anything else, it's this approach that's defined Silicon Valley legacy in this century. Moving technology from big tent catch-all problems to a laser focus that's happy not just to toss out the hardest 5% of any problem, but the hardest 60%. And we're starting to see that disruptive model applied across the board, even in industry and healthcare. And I don't want to rag on these teams too hard. This is a great approach if your goal is to give your users a great tool for presenting slides with low consequences. But it is a terrible approach if your goal isn't to reach the most profitable set of users, but the most important set of human beings. And increasingly, technology companies across the board, big and small, are being trained not on how to solve problems, but how to find problems that match known cheap solutions. And the inequity of that approach is built right into the model. Google's exposure notification system doesn't even work on any of their phones that are older than five years old. They're largely in the hands of persons with fewer resources, populations are suffering the most from COVID's disease burden. Coupled with individuals without a smartphone at all, we're talking about an intervention that might ignore the moat at risk 30% of the target population, not by failure, but by design. You could do worse, but I don't really have time to talk now about the blockchain. The reason I wanted to harp on the economics of technology before was to highlight that Silicon Valley can't fix this inequity. It's built into their DNA. And in a world of apps that are built to help populations that'll never see them, the relative success of global goods in fighting COVID-19 highlights their most important value. 
Every global good is a road for someone to use technology to reach and make an impact on the life of someone who needs it the most, not the least. And in a pandemic, countries can't afford for those people to be out of reach. And roads aren't magic, right? Roads take years to build. They're expensive to maintain and nobody wants to pay for them. People who use them every day complain about potholes and wish they had one more lane. But when you, we need an ambulance, we all hope our community was investing in roads five years ago instead of asking Silicon Valley when we can have flying cars. Because even when you get those flying cars, you should see what's under the hood. You know what Google's Ebola-proof tablets actually are? It's an Android tablet and a plastic shell that's running OpenMRS, an open source global good that's been in continuous development for 15 years. And you wanna know something crazy? When the 2018 Ebola outbreak hit the Congo, just when it was time for this tool to hit the front lines on day one, this time when it could make a difference, OpenMRS was still there. To the best of my knowledge, those Google Magic tablets, they were already gone. Google identified that it was critical for the world to have a tool to support doctors to fight a rare, deadly disease that flares up rapidly, and they couldn't even be bothered to make sure that it was still around two years after the press died down. So when you wanna see the high-tech future, public health impact, look around the room or the Zoom because no one else is coming. And just in case you uh, have a couple million dollars and you need to spend it to make those solutions work in a hot zone, well, it buys a lot of plastic bags. Thanks for your time.